Hi everyone. Today's lesson is going to be a continuation of our last time together. Uh, specifically last time we discussed um, the transport maximum, um, essentially how the rate of transport, either secretion or reabsorption of substances such as glucose across that renal tubule membrane is going to be dependent on how many channels or pumps for that substance, such as glucose, are actually in that membrane. And so we can talk about that um, maximum transport rate as the transport maximum. The example I gave was uh, when uh, an individual has poorly managed diabetes, specifically diabetes mellitus, and we're going to, um, in a later lesson, talk about a different type of diabetes, um, which is called insipidus. Um, and Essentially, when you have high blood sugar, because either your own body's immune system is attacking your insulin-making cells of the pancreas, or you have secreted so much insulin over the course of your life that your insulin receptors on your tissues, which may be genetically prone to become desensitized, become desensitized. And so essentially you can throw out as much insulin into your blood as you can, but still that glucose is not going to be picked back up out of the blood and deposited into the cells. And therefore you have really high blood sugar. And also at the same time, your cells, your the tissues of your body aren't getting enough glucose, aren't getting enough energy. And so um, it's kind of like, you know, being stranded in the ocean right, um, on a raft or something, and um, you're surrounded by water, but you can't drink that water, right? You can't drink salt water because that will actually dehydrate you, which is also relevant here. Um, but essentially, you are sur your tissue cells are surrounded by glucose, but they can't actually use that glucose. And so this produces a lot of side effects. Um, again, this is all a review of our last time together. But essentially, um, if glucose can't actually be taken up into your cells, um, because of a lack of insulin or an insensitivity to insulin, um, your adipose cells, as well as the other tissues of your body, can start to break down stored fat, right? While that might seem to be a lovely thing, um, essentially that fat is converted into ketone bodies by your liver so that at least your heart and your brain can actually survive um, this starvation mode. Um, so ketone bodies um, are actually really acidic, um, and so we can bring our pH way down. Um, and uh, ultimately, that's where we're going today. Um, we left off in our last class talking about ketoacidosis and hyperkalemia. We're going to discuss that again, elaborate on it a little bit more today when we talk about acid-base balance. Um, but before we do, I also want to point out that um, not only uh, is your body really acidic, right, have way too much potassium, um, but also um, these high glucose levels can also be apparent within your urine as well. Usually the transport maximum of glucose is never exceeded as long as your blood sugar stays below about 220. However, with poorly managed diabetes, uh, your blood sugar can be above 220 for an extended period of time, um, and ultimately you end up with glucose in your urine. Um, and so this glucose in your urine can be detected by a urinalysis, which you guys are going to be doing in the lab. Um, so glucose in the urine, not good. That indicates that your blood sugar is so high that you physically can't reabsorb all of that glucose back into your blood. Um, also, glucose as acts as, um, or it generates osmotic pressure, right? So essentially it is pulling water from your blood back into the filtrate, okay? And so essentially this means that you have a larger volume of urine okay? and you can become more dehydrated, okay? So we can actually look at um, different values, different substances uh, within the urine uh, to determine whether or not you are having these um, diabetic symptoms, okay? So um, to be continued, right? In the lab, you'll look at a urinalysis and you'll think about, um, you know, what things that you see versus not see um, in the urine in someone who has diabetes mellitus and later diabetes insipids. Right, but for now, in this lesson, let us continue our discussion of acid-base balance. Now, this is something we started talking about literally day one of class, but today I hope that we can start to pull this entire concept together. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about chemical buffers. At this point, we've only really discussed bicarbonate. Okay. Um, however, there are actually a lot of other ones as well. Um, so we'll talk about those. We'll talk about the respiratory system and the urinary system and how both of these can essentially buffer the blood. 
Okay. Um, and so how they can actually be used to respond to different types of shifts in pH. Okay. Um, then we'll talk about disorders. Okay. So there's this um, concept where um, the respiratory system can either be the problem or it can be the solution. Right? If you have COPD, your pH is going to shift. And of course, your respiratory system can't compensate for that shift. It can't fix that problem because the respiratory system, system itself is the problem. Okay? Um, but if you are vomiting, right, your respiratory system can modify what it does. You can breathe faster or slower. We'll talk about that because of the loss of um, hydrogen ions via your vomiting. Okay, so the respiratory system and urinary system can compensate, but only in certain circumstances. Okay, so sometimes these systems are the problem and sometimes there's the solution. Okay, so um, acid-base balance, once and for all. Um, most hydrogen is produced by your metabolism. Okay, so a, a lot of different processes within your body are continually producing um, or releasing at least uh, hydrogen ions. Um, for example, um, the breakdown of phosphorus containing proteins in the extracellular fluid, that is the blood and the interstitial fluid, right? That fluid is, that's just surrounding all of um, the extracellular matrix as well as um, our cells. Um, so there's a lot of chemical reactions occurring within that fluid and we release a lot of phosphoric acid. So, right, bringing the pH down all the time. Um, we know that as a byproduct of anaerobic respiration, that is making ATP without the use of oxygen. Okay, and so this is happening um, in all of our cells, particularly when we work so hard, so exercising so hard um, that our aerobic respiration cannot keep up. Essentially, we produce a lot of lactic acid, and that um, is one of the reasons why you get that kind of like cramp in your side when you're exercising. Um, that's because those muscles are releasing a lot of acid. Okay. Um, fat metabolism, right? So if you are exercising a lot or you are limiting your caloric intake, etc., um, you might start to break down fatty acids, right? And maybe produce some ketone bodies if um, your metabolism um, is in such a state. Okay, so fatty acids and ketone bodies are both acidic, right? Again, bring your pH down. Um, also, hydrogen ions are liberated when carbon dioxide is converted into bicarbonate in the blood. Okay, so we're going to see that equation again where we have CO2, which can ultimately become bicarbonate and hydrogen, and we can pull that equation back in the other direction, taking hydrogen, joining it together with bicarbonate, and ultimately producing water and carbon dioxide. Okay? Um, so again, all of these different acids are produced, they're released into the body, into the extracellular fluids. Um, mm -hmm by your metabolism, by different types of chemical reactions occurring in your body. Um, again, as we know, we need to maintain a pH in our blood and our extracellular fluids of approximately 7.4. Now there's a teeny bit of wiggle room, but our body is actually very good at maintaining 7.4. Okay. We know that any shift outside of this pretty narrow range produces a condition called acidosis if it's too low or alkalosis if it's too high. Okay, so acidosis itself is a physiological condition, okay? It is caused by having a pH below 7.35 in the blood. So we can say acidemia, right? Emia is in the blood, okay? Um, also, this is closely linked to hyperkalemia. All right, and let me point out that the K here is referring to potassium. So hyper, too much K, potassium, in the blood, okay? Um, so we mentioned this before, we're going to come back to this again in a couple slides. Okay. Um, we know that severe acidosis can be deadly, okay, so we cannot drop below seven approximately, um, or else um, we start to have some severe uh, negative impacts on the central nervous system. Okay. Remember that we need to maintain very particular concentration gradients over those membranes of our neurons and also our skeletal muscles, um, all of our muscles, um, in order to be able to generate action potentials. Okay, so when the pH shifts, those concentration gradients are shift, shifting. Also, we know that too much acid can start to unravel or denature all of the proteins of our body. 
Um, so this is obviously not ideal. Proteins give rise to all of the different functions of our tissues. And so if those same proteins start to unravel, they can no longer function. Okay, so we need to have exactly the right pH. Um, see, cardiac contractions grow weak and irregular. Right? Remember that um, we have to maintain these concentration gradients to generate the pacemaker potential. Okay, and also we need to um, allow calcium into those cells only at particular times, or else there'll be a really weak interaction between actin and myosin and therefore weak pathetic little contractions. Okay, obviously not ideal. Um, and so for similar reasons, the blood pressure can drop um, and this can lead to circulatory collapse, right? So not ideal at all. Um, on the other hand, alkalosis, the other physiological condition here um, is when your pH is too high. Um, this can also uh, be linked to hypokalemia, right? And really hyper and hypokalemia are um, side effects of acidosis and alkalosis. That is, it's the body's response to too much hydrogen or not enough hydrogen that is going to ultimately affect the potassium concentration in your extracellular fluids. Okay. Um, as you can see on the slide here, this can be dangerous, um, but it is relatively rare. Usually um, the condition that is most common and most lethal is acidosis. Um, generally the, um, the main symptom of this, all right, that indicates that you actually have a problem here is the pins and needles sensation, right? And again, this is, um, also linked to the potassium, right? So your body is trying to fix the acidosis or alkalosis, and so we're going to play with potassium to kind of compensate. Okay, um, so really important to maintain hydrogen concentrations. Um, we regulate these concentrations sequentially, right? So first we do this, and if that's not enough, we do this, and if that's not enough, we do this. So the first thing that we do is we utilize our chemical buffer systems, right? These are right there, they're always present, um, and we can buffer pH to a certain extent, right? We can shift it a little bit, but this is not permanent, okay? Um, from there, right, within one to three minutes, our brain um, is essentially informed that there's a problem. Um, and so it is going to modify your respiratory system, right? Breathe faster, breathe slower to ultimately um, change how much carbon dioxide is going to be released from the body or held within the body, okay? And so um, again, if these chemical buffer systems aren't enough, our brain stem can enact some changes within the respiratory system. And then finally, if that's still not enough, our rest or Right, our renal system, right, our urinary system uh, can get involved. Um, this is the most potent, right, but it does require a little bit of time um, to produce substantial changes with your kidneys. Right? It can take hours or days to really shift the pH um, more in the long term. Okay, so let's talk about these buffer systems. We know that the bicarbonate buffer system is the most important in our extracellular fluid, so outside of our cells, in our blood, in our interstitium. Um, we also know from our discussion of the respiratory system that carbon dioxide is the most important, pa important factor affecting the pH of the body's tissues, right? We save more CO2 in our body, we exhale more CO2 in our body. This is what essentially shifts that equation back and forth, right and left, um, to ultimately determine how much free hydrogen there is in the body's tissues, right? So when I talk about that equation, I'm talking about this reversible reaction here. Okay, so um, if carbon dioxide increases, right, so you aren't exhaling as much, and so this can be because you have COPD, this can be because you have asthma, this can be because you are holding your breath, right? Um, whatever the reason is, carbon dioxide is going to increase in your body, right? We know it combines with water, and ultimately we're going to release hydrogen ions out into the body's fluid, and so this decreases the pH. And so this is an example of the respiratory system shifting the pH, like the respiratory system is the problem. Okay? Um, on the other hand, if CO2 decreases, right, so you're hyperventilating because you're freaking out about something, um, hydrogen ions are taken up onto bicarbonate and the equation shifts in this direction. Therefore, we can release more carbon dioxide out of the body. And because 
um, these hydrogen ions have been um, bound up on bicarbonate, the pH is going to increase. And again, this is a reversible reaction. And so um, this buffer system really is efficient at shifting pH one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. One additional detail here. Um, we can see that bicarbonate, of course, is made by um, carbonic anhydrase, right? Joining together and, or yeah, joining together water and carbon dioxide to ultimately make um, this hydrogen and bicarbonate mix. Um, however, um, our kidneys can also play a role in um, the strength of this buffer system. Um, this isn't the only way that we can make bicarbonate. Bicarbonate can be made in the nephron, right? It can be made, as we can see here, in the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, new bicarbonate um, ions are created inside the proximal convoluted tubule cells. As we can see, we have um, glutamine, which can be split into bicarbonate and ammonia, right? Um, and so this process, right, um, this process can actually help us increase the pH in a couple different ways. Remember that acidosis is usually the problem. It's very rarely alkalosis. Um, and so glutamine can be broken into bicarbonate, right? Therefore, adding bicarbonate ions into the blood, right? And so every single bicarbonate ion that we have in the blood is essentially one fewer hydrogen ion that we have in the blood, right? So we're actually increasing the buffering capacity of this buffering system by adding more bicarbonate ions. Also, um, the other product of splitting glutamine is ammonia, okay? And ammonia can actually bind with free hydrogen ions, just like bicarbonate can. And when it does so, it becomes ammonium. And ammonium is released into the filtrate and it goes out with the wash. Okay, so we're specifically secreting ammonium, which is going to increase the pH. Again, that's usually the problem. We usually need to bring it back up. Um, and we're also adding more bicarbonate into the blood. Okay, so um, this is just one of many ways that the kidney can shift the pH. Okay, and it does so by its uh, effects on the bicarbonate buffer system. Okay, uh, the next buffer system, this is uh, new to us. Um, the next buffer system is the protein buffer system. Um, for the most part, proteins are contained inside of our cells. And so this buffer system is very important in buffering the inside of our cells. And so we can see intracellular proteins, very important um, in our tissues. Okay, um, we do have plasma proteins, of course, right, such as hemoglobin, right, we do have some proteins within the interstitial fluid, okay, so anywhere we have a protein, we actually have a buffer as well. Okay, so uh, what we can see is at a neutral pH, the carboxyl end of each and every amino acid all right, so amino acids are carbon, carbon, nitrogen. The R group is referring to the uh, particular um, group, the particular amino acid that it actually is. Um, at a neutral pH, the carboxyl end of this amino acid has a bound hydrogen. If the pH rises, okay, so if the pH is starting to get a little bit too high, this hydrogen ion can dissociate. It can jump off this carboxyl uh, molecule and into the fluid, therefore bringing the pH back down. Okay. On the other hand, if the pH falls, again, this is the much more common scenario. If the pH falls, hydrogen ions that are free in the fl uh, body's fluids can bind reversibly, of course, to this amine group of the protein. And so again, proteins are um, chains of amino acids. Each amino acid has a carboxyl group and an amine group, and each of these can either bind or release hydrogen ions depending on the pH of the body. And so proteins in and of themselves are their own buffers. And the final buffer system, chemical buffer system that is, is the phosphate buffer system. Okay, the phosphate buffer system um, is only found inside of our cells. Right, so proteins are found in the extracellular fluid and inside the cells. The phosphate buffer system is only important inside the cells. 
Okay. Um, and generally it functions the same as bicarbonate, only bicarbonate's in the blood and phosphate is in, um, in the cytoplasm. And so again, we can see that there is this reversible reaction. If there are too many hydrogen ions, hydrogen is going to bind to this crazy phosphate molecule and produce this right here. So the hydrogen is bound up and we release sodium instead. If there are not enough hydrogen ions, right? So two alkaline one of these hydrogens is going to be released, pushing this equation in this direction um, and um, releasing the hydrogens to bring the pH back down. And so uh, this is a nice summary of all of these. Buffer systems exist inside the cells. They exist outside the cells. The most important extracellular one is uh, the carp. Carbonic acid bicarbonate, which we already know. Inside the cells, we use phosphate, and proteins exist in both. Okay, um, and so this includes hemoglobin, it includes any kind of amino acids, and it includes all of those plasma proteins. So let's now talk about some of the disorders um, in acid base balance. Right. As I said before, we can classify these as either respiratory or metabolic. Right? So these are the problems, not the solutions. Right? The solutions are the buffers and ultimately these two organ systems. Um, but let's talk about the problems and see what mechanisms we can use to actually fix them. Um, so first and foremost, we have the respiratory acid-base disorders. This results from an imbalance in carbon dioxide generation or elimination. Okay, so. Um, Often this is linked to um, an issue with your respiratory system, right? You have a problem exhaling, right? Because there is a restriction or sorry, if there's an obstruction, right? Um, you can't exhale very easily. Um, and so it's uh, the most common really type of uh, respiratory acid-base disorder. Um, thing is, we can't actually use that most common buffer system in order to fix this problem. Okay, so the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system is using carbon dioxide to shift this buffer system back and forth depending on the needs of the body. But if we can't make and eliminate carbon dioxide appropriately, we can't actually use this buffer system to fix this particular disorder. Um, in order to change how much carbon dioxide is in your blood and therefore what your pH is, um, you can change the depth and rate of respiration. Okay, so if you are having a problem making carbon dioxide in your body, you can use your respiratory system to fix that problem, right? You're going to exhale less carbon dioxide, so more CO2 stays in your body. Um, so the respiratory system and the urinary system can be used to fix these disorders right, to bring your pH back to where it needs to be, as long as the reason carbon dioxide isn't shifted isn't your respiratory system, okay? So if you have too much carbon dioxide in your blood because you can't exhale enough carbon dioxide because you have obstructions within your lungs, you can, of course, use your respiratory system to fix that problem, right? So in that case, um, if you have COPD, for example, you can't use your bicarbonate buffer system, you can't use your lungs, and you're dependent upon your kidneys. Okay. Um, the other type of disorder is the metabolic acid-based disorders, um, and these result from production or loss of excessive amounts of fixed or organic acids. All right. So in the beginning of this presentation, we talked about um, uh, all the different places where acids are produced and released into the blood. And so any of those, right? So lots of lac lactic acid from exercising a lot, um, lots of ketones, right? From dieting a lot while you're exercising a lot um, and so on and so forth. Um, that can of course shift the pH of your blood. Um, and these would be considered metabolic acid-base disorders. Um, your carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system really is um, the most important in protecting your body against these disorders, right? And that's why they're so rare. We don't all have shifts in acid in our pH all the time because the bicarbonate buffer system is just so powerful. Okay, so let's uh, take a look here. Uh, metabolic acidosis, right? So caused by a shift in pH due to something other than carbon dioxide, right? Some other kinds of acids are being dumped into your blood. Um, 
So pH is going to decrease. The first thing that happens is that these chemical buffers, right, are going to act to restore homeostasis, right? So if the problem is we have too much hydrogen, right, addition of too much hydrogen here, we can use bicarbonate to bind up this extra hydrogen, right, and therefore bring pH back up. Okay, so we shift the uh, this reaction in this direction, and therefore our lungs can eliminate that carbon dioxide, right? Therefore, keeping the hydrogen bound up in water. Okay, um, we also use other buffer systems to absorb the hydrogen, right? So the proteins in our blood are also going to help us to eliminate this extra hydrogen. Um, with this additional CO2 in our blood, because bicarbonate has been binding up so much hydrogen, your respiratory system is going to um, is going to increase the respiratory rate. Sorry, uh, it's going to increase the respiratory rate to exhale all of this excess CO2. So, um, if you think about it, um, after you're finished exercising, right, you still kind of have that cramp in your side. You might still have a really hard, really fast breathing rate. Right? And the reason for that is that we are still trying to get rid of that excess hydrogen by exhaling CO2. Now, even though you're not exercising anymore, even though your tissues aren't actively needing lots and lots and lots more oxygen, you're still breathing pretty hard so that you can exhale the CO2 that was made by binding up these extra hydrogen ions. Okay? Um, so again, we increase our respiratory rate when our respiratory system is trying to compensate, right? It's trying to fix the problem of metabolic acidosis, right? Our metabolism worked really hard. It put a lot of acid into our blood. Our respiratory system compensates by essentially getting rid of carbon dioxide to bring the pH back up, okay? Also, um, if this problem um, is existing long enough, right? So it doesn't just go away. It's not fixed by respiratory compensation, we can get our kidneys involved, okay? So the renal compensation, remember, um, this is going to take a little bit longer. It might take hours to days to really shift the pH, um, but the renal system, the kidneys, can fix this problem. They can bring the pH back up in a more longer-term situation. Um, and how do they do that? Well, they can secrete more hydrogen ions, okay? They can remove more carbon dioxide, right, through the kidneys into the filtrate, um, and they can reabsorb more bicarbonate. Therefore, every single bicarbonate that's back in the blood is essentially one fewer hydrogen ion that's left in that blood being free. Okay, so again, the kidneys can change how much hydrogen, CO2, and bicarbonate is within the blood versus within the filtrate. Okay, so this is why the kidneys are kind of the end-all be-all. They are what permanently gets rid of the hydrogen ions, right? Even the respiratory system leaves the hydrogen in the body as water, right? So it's not actually getting rid of that hydrogen, but the kidneys can. The kidneys can actually get rid of that hydrogen. All right, so uh, I want to zoom in on what's happening um, in the distal convoluted tubule. Remember that the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct are part of the facultative portion of the nephron. Okay, so this is where we can actually change what is going on, right? Our body is too acidic right now. We need to get rid of more hydrogen ions to fix the problem, to compensate for this problem. Okay, so we see at the top, renal compensation. Compensation is fixing the problem of acidosis. Um, so what we can see here is in the DCT cells, here's the soon-to-be urine, here is in the body extracellular fluid, so this is going to be in the blood. We can take carbon dioxide, join it with water with the same carbonic anhydrase that we keep seeing over and over again, making carbonic acid. We know carbonic acid immediately dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen. And the cool thing here is that, yes, we make bicarbonate and hydrogen just like we've seen so many times with the respiratory system and in the blood, but here, the kidney can actually decide which direction these two byproducts go. These two products of this reaction are going to go. In this case, the problem is we have too much hydrogen in the body. And so the resulting hydrogen ions are going to be pushed into the tubule. And so they're going to be pushed into the filtrate to go out in the urine. 
okay? The bicarbonate is going to be pushed into the body, right? Therefore, we have now just eliminated multiple hydrogen ions directly, and bicarbonate is going to go forth in the blood, and it's going to bind up even more hydrogen ions, okay? So this is where the kidney is going to compensate for the problem, the metabolic acidosis, in multiple ways, right? It's making more bicarbonate and eliminating more hydrogen ions, okay? The side effect of this, right? So here is the true connection between acidosis, right? Your pH is too low, you need to get rid of hydrogen ions, and hyperkalemia. Right, again, we can see the nephron, PCT, and loop of Henle. This is where stuff is going to happen the same way, no matter what's going on with the body. But once we get into the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule, this is the facultative portion. So this is where we decide, are we getting rid of hydrogen or are we going to get rid of potassium instead? Okay, so the thing is here that low pH, too much hydrogen, can cause hydrogen ions to be substituted for potassium ions in sodium potassium pumps. So normally, um, if the pH is normal, good to go, Sodium is pumped into the body, right? So out of the filtrate, which is purple here. And in exchange, potassium is pumped into the filtrate, okay? So these are sodium potassium pumps. They pump sodium in exchange for potassium. Three sodium, two potassium. Um, and so this is normal. This both retains a lot of sodium so that your body's sodium content is really high and it gets rid of potassium, right? This is going to go out in the wash, um, therefore maintaining the appropriate concentration gradients so that our neurons, our muscle cells can all generate action potentials in the right way, right? They're not too sensitive. They're not, not sensitive enough, okay? Um, and so when we have a super low pH, instead of pumping potassium, we pump hydrogen in its place. And so now we're pumping the same three sodiums in, but now we're pumping hydrogen out. And so this, yes, it does bring the pH back up to where it needs to be. So it's no longer as acidic. We're finally peeing out that hydrogen. But if we're not pumping potassium into the urine, the potassium is going to stay over here in the body. And so now the body's potassium levels are going to increase as the pH of the body increases as well. Okay, um, and so this leads to hyperkalemia, right? So you should think acidosis, um, side effect, hyperkalemia, too much potassium. Um, remember, we have discussed a couple times at this point ketoacidosis, so a type of metabolic acidosis that is a result of too many ketone bodies, either because you're diabetic or you're going on um, a super strict diet without a lot of carbohydrates. So essentially your glucose is so low that your liver has to you know, save the body from starvation. Um, or you are taking ketone bodies for whatever reason, um, not actually helping you. Um, the, the presence of ketone bodies in your urine just indicates that your body has burned through all its glycogen and glucose stores and it's digging into your fat stores. Right? So that indicates that you have lost weight. <laughs> right? Um, but taking ketone bodies is not helping you lose weight, okay? Not at all, okay? So ketoacidosis is also associated with hyperkalemia, right? Because of this shift from pumping potassium out to pumping hydrogen out, okay? The other side of this coin is metabolic acidosis, right? So this happens when large numbers of hydrogen ions are removed from the body, therefore raising the pH. And the example I keep using is a lot of vomiting. Um, there are other situations where this could happen, um, but this is a lot more rare than acidosis. Okay, so how does the kidney compensate? Again, I cannot say this enough. The compensation is the kidneys trying to fix the problem. Right? The respiratory system can fix the problem. The buffers can fix the problem. The kidneys can fix the problem. And so that's all compensation. On the other hand, the respiratory system can cause the problem, okay? Um, so here we have the kidney trying to compensate for metabolic acidosis. We don't have enough hydrogen ions in the body. Um, so what we can do in the kidney is um, reduce how much hydrogen the kidney is going to secrete, 
right? So secreting is taking hydrogen from the body and dumping it into the filtrate or the soon to be urine. Okay, so we can take a look at this uh, DCT cell again, um, again, taking carbon dioxide, joining it with water with the carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic acid is going to split. And again, our DCT in particular can decide which direction the hydrogen and bicarbonate are going. The problem here is that we don't have enough hydrogen. And so the hydrogen ions are going to be reabsorbed back into the body to therefore bring the pH back down. All right, the problem is pH is high. We bring it lower by saving the hydrogen and at the same time, dumping the bicarbonate into the tubule. Okay, so bicarbonate goes away. Remember that every single bicarbonate in your body is essentially one fewer hydrogen ion that can be circulating in your, uh, in your blood. So by getting rid of bicarbonate and saving the hydrogen ion, you have more or less added two hydrogen ions to your blood. Okay, um, also um, our tubules reclaim bicarbonate, right? Normally, um, because our pH is usually a little bit low, um, we usually reabsorb as much bicarbonate as we possibly can, but that stops if you're too alkaline, okay? So we have many layers of compensation to make sure that our pH does not ever swing outside of 7.35 to 7.45, okay? Respiratory compensation, right? So the lungs can try to fix the problem as well, right? So if you are too alkaline, okay, um, we have lost too many hydrogen ions for whatever reason, okay? Our kidney can conserve hydrogen and secrete bicarbonate, right? We just talked about that. And our lungs can stop exhaling as much carbon dioxide, right? So if you start breathing slower, more carbon dioxide is going to build up in your blood, which we know then ultimately is going to form bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So bicarbonate can spit off this extra hydrogen, therefore replacing the lost hydrogens. Okay, so a, uh, a method of compensating, method of fixing metabolic acidosis is your lungs exhaling less CO2. Right. So um, if you know, your roommate is vomiting right, and you check on them, you see that they are breathing super slowly. Right? It may not have nothing to do with whatever reason they're vomiting. I'm not going to go there. It may be their body trying to compensate for the loss of hydrogen ions in said vomit. Right? So they are breathing less, so they save more CO2 therefore bringing the pH back down. Mm -hmm. And so now that we have talked about how the body can actually compensate for shifts outside of this normal range of pH, I do want to uh, make a little sidebar here about different types of diets. Um, I have at this point uh, talked about uh, ketones, right? And how ketones um, are essentially indicating that your body has burned through all of its immediate energy stores, right? So all of its free glucose, all of its glycogen, and now it's digging into those fat stores, breaking them down and making ketone bodies as a result, um, because, you know, your body's more or less in starvation mode. Um, and so ketone bodies are a an indication that your body is breaking down fat. When you take ketones, right? So if you are actually taking supplemental ketones, you are just you know, putting more ketones into your urine for no reason whatsoever. It's not going to help you lose weight. Ketones that your body produces are indicating that you are losing weight, right? So I um, think it's always important to think about how the body works and really analyze what you are hearing, what you are seeing, these different things that are advertised. Um, Maybe at some point there will be some magical cure, some magical solution to a lot of different problems such as weight, um, but maybe not yet, right? So I do want to mention um, a little bit about the alkaline diets, right? So um, at this point, a lot of 
different companies are advertising how the alkaline diet is the new solution to all sorts of different things. Um, people are advised to eat only foods with a basic pH, so fruits and vegetables, for example, as opposed to acidic foods, which include meat, they include beans and seeds and whole grains, and um, even some things that we would otherwise consider to be healthy. Right? Um, and so these individuals say that by cutting out all of the acidic foods, you are going to stop the inflammatory process in your body, and it is the inflammatory process which causes disease. Okay, so by having an only alkaline diet, right, only fruits and vegetables, and not even like the citrusy types of vegetables, but this is going to cure everything. Right. Everything that's wrong with your body, including cancer, is going to be cured by having this alkaline diet. All right. So I want to um, <laughs> refresh your memory on what we got done talking about not long ago. Um, when you eat food, right, you chew it up, you make a bolus, you swallow it, and as soon as that bolus gets into your stomach, your stomach is going to either secrete lots of um, hydrochloric acid or not, depending on the pH of whatever food that was that you ate. Um, and so. Um, no matter what the pH of your food is, your stomach is shooting for a pH of two. And as we know, it works really hard to maintain that pH of two, right? Lots of receptors, lots of um, glands that are going to make sure that's the case. Um, we also know that as soon as the stomach is done churning that chyme, it's going to go into the duodenum. And in the duodenum, the pH of that chyme is going to be increased back to seven or eight-ish. Um, and so again, no matter what the pH of food you're eating is, stomach's gonna be two, duodenum's gonna be seven or eight. <laughs> so um, thinking that our, our body is dependent upon us to consciously decide the pH of the food that we're eating to ultimately determine its pH, it, pH is a little naive and it's incorrect frankly. Um, we know at this point after this lesson and, you know, we've been building on this all semester, if we eat super acidic food or if we eat super alkaline food, even if our stomach and our duodenum didn't put so much effort into changing the pHs within the GI tract, outside the GI tract, we have our chemical buffers to shift the pH. We have our respiratory system, which can shift the pH. We have our renal system, to shift the pH, right? So all of these different systems are backing up the fact that no matter what you eat, your body's pH is going to remain the same. It is super important to maintain this pH because if we don't, we can die, right? So our body makes sure that we don't have to think about it because let's face it, we're not going to think about it. And frankly, acidic food tastes super good. So we're gonna eat it no matter what. And so our body has to compensate for that. Okay, so even if you only eat fruits and vegetables, right, your, your pH is going to be the same no matter what, right? Um, chances are if you're losing weight um, or if you are getting healthier and all of a sudden you're not having all these aches and pains and everything, it's probably because you're eating fruits and vegetables as opposed to drinking soda and having hamburgers all the time, right? So it's all tied together here. Um, and I really hope that you can think about these things before you jump on any of these bandwagons. Um, all right, so one more note here. Are all diseases a, a result of acidic body fluid or acidic pH in your body fluids? Um, so it is true that an inflammatory response is associated with acid, right? So inflammation is tied to acid, but not in the ways that these individuals are telling you it is. Um, the, as part of the inflammatory response, our cells are, are, um, that are arriving on the scene are going to release acid into that um, region, right? Into that localized area of the infection. And the reason for that is that a lot of things, including our own cells, um, don't really handle acid very well. And so these cells, as part of their, you know, cytokine storm, as part of their phagocytosis, like this huge inflammatory process, um, they are going to increase, or sorry, they are going to decrease the pH, make it more acidic in that localized area of infection so that it decreases the activity of the invading pathogens. So it's not that acid is causing inflammation, 
it's that inflammation is causing the acid, right? It is true that um, inflammation is associated with a lot of aches and pains, and it can be associated with different dietary shifts and lifestyle choices and whatnot. Um, but in this case, right, inflammation is not caused by the acid. Inflammation produces the acid in the localized area of infection. Okay, so um, again, I hope that you can approach these different um, things that you hear on the news and different ads that you get um, with awareness of how the human body works. After two semesters in this class, um, I hope that um, you can make decisions about what you put in your body um, in an informed manner, right? And if I haven't told you about things, I hope that you can seek out the information and build upon what we have learned here together. All right. Um, okay, so um, off my soapbox for a little bit. Um, acid or respiratory acid-based disorders. Um, respiratory acid-based disorders are the most common challenges to acid-base balance. Um, remember that they cannot be corrected or compensated for by the bicarbonate buffer system. Um, and so the kidneys really have to pick up the slack here. Okay, um, respiratory acidosis, right? So this means that the respiratory system is the problem. Therefore, the respiratory system cannot compensate. It cannot fix the problem because it is the problem, right? Um, so respiratory acidosis, um, the more common of the two, um, leads to too much carbon dioxide building up in your blood. Therefore, it exceeds the capacity of this uh, normal buffer system to continue buffering. And therefore, um, it is going to lower the blood pH. Okay, so there are lots of causes of this problem, right? So um, we, of course, have talked about a lot of blockages, right? So COPD, blocking air passages, um, decreased gas exchange in the alveoli, right? So like pneumonia or something, um, brainstem dysfunction even. So if you're physically breathing more, um, more slowly because of some issue with your brainstem, um, this can all lead to respiratory acidosis. Okay. Um, and so the responses, right? So what can compensate if not the bicarbonate or the respiratory system? Well, um, let's see, we can uh, stimulate the arterial and cerebrospinal fluid chemoreceptors resulting in increased respiratory rate. So you can try to breathe faster, right? So if you look at a COPD patient, um, you'll see that they're trying to breathe faster, but generally those breaths are pretty shallow and they're not actually fixing the issue. Um, what is really um, helpful here is the kidneys, right? So the kidneys are going to need to secrete tons of hydrogen and make tons of bicarbonate, right? So, um, right, the combined effects are hopefully decreasing carbon dioxide, right? And decreasing the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. Okay, so, right, take home message, the problem or respiratory acidosis is caused by for example, an issue with the lungs, right? So you have blockages, you can't exhale as much as you need to. You can try to breathe faster, but really the problem is your lungs and so that's not going to fix it. And so your kidneys have to pick up all of the slack here. They have to save more bicarbonate, right? Or make more bicarbonate and get rid of as much hydrogen as physically possible. Okay. Alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. Um, involves the elimination of too much carbon dioxide. You're breathing too much, right? And it's generally not very common and it's rarely severe, um, right? The bigger problem is always the um, acidosis, okay? Um, so if you are hyperventilating, right? You're breathing way too much. This exhales too much carbon dioxide because of this lack of carbon dioxide within your blood now. Um, you can either stop hyperventilating, right? Um, and so if you pass out when you're hyperventilating, that is essentially your um, your brainstem saying, nope, got to slow down and I'm going to make you slow down because I'm going to turn off the rest of your brain for a second so that I can fix your breathing. Um, but also the, the uh, carbonic acid and bi bicarbonate buffer system is going to be exhausted, right? We can use the proteins, etc., but we can't use that. And so again, the kidneys really are the only ones that are compensating for respiratory alkalosis.
Okay, so hopefully they can put more hydrogen ions into the blood, they can secrete more bicarbonate and hopefully return the body back to normal. Okay. And that is all for today. Um, stay tuned in our next lesson for, um, for discussions about blood pressure and regulating other types of ions. Thank you guys so much for watching today.